Hey there, Rick Sage, recording at the Rimrock Studios in Bishop, California. Welcome to Season 3 of the Outdoor Biz Podcast, where I speak with retailers, brand managers, athletes, executives, and others in the outdoor biz and share their stories, tips, advice, productivity tricks, and ideas you can use to take your career or business to the next level. Today's podcast is brought to you by Creative Live. Start learning for free today with their amazing selection of on-air classes. With over 1,500 curated classes in photography and video, money and life, craft and maker, art and design, and music and audio, there is something for everyone. I've watched many of their on-air broadcasts for free or buy a class and own the content for life. Go to theoutdoorbizpodcast.com slash creative live and start building creative skills from the world's top experts today. Hey, hey, Outdoor Tribe. I hope everyone had a fantastic Thanksgiving. Today I'm speaking with Sean Frederick of Adriatic Adventure Academy. Sean and his wife have recently launched their new adventure and photo retreat business, and we talk about their inspiration, challenges, as well as Sean's photo career shooting some of the best action sport athletes in the world. Thanks, Sean. Hey, Sean. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Rick. Great to catch up again. So we were talking over the weekend about how we connected uh, via, I guess it was Facebook, and I think you discovered that we both spent time in Fontana. Is that right? Is that how that came about? That's, I'm forgetting already. That's, yeah, yeah. No, no, you're right. You're yeah. right. I, uh, you and I spoke and uh, connected, and then I uh, happened to be on Facebook and noticed that uh, you and I had a couple of uh, friends from the old town in common. Yeah, so. yeah. So, listeners, i got to tell everybody that I grew up in Fontana, and Sean spent a few years in Fontana in junior high and high school, and it's uh, it's quite a cool place to be from. We got a lot of great friends there. It's um, not as beautiful now as it was then, I'll say, but uh, it's a good place to be from. <laughs> it, it it really is. It's uh, completely different these days, I suspect. And uh, yeah, it was def- definitely one of those places that was fun. We could uh, take off out of our front yard and go dirt bike riding up into the hills with not much traffic in between of us. No traffic. Yeah, There's so. a two ten freeway there now. There was nothing there then. <laughs> Yeah, that you're right. There was no freeway then. I think it was probably eight or ten miles, or maybe even more, just uh, open fields. Yeah, yeah, it was amazing. Yeah. yeah. So, what was your inspiration to get outdoors? Was it riding dirt bikes back then as a kid? Yeah, I think as a kid, and you know, uh, get out and, and ride dirt bikes, or go ride skateboards, or try and find empty swimming pools around the neighborhood to, <laughs> yeah. to skateboard in. You know. Yeah, so I think that was at an early age uh, uh-huh. as a young young kid. And you played sports uh, too, think. right? I did. I did. Early on, I played a lot of baseball, and uh, that was kind of my primary sport of choice as a youngster, and mm-hmm. played that all the way through high school. Oh. And, uh, but obviously, uh, skateboarded. And, you know, growing up in Southern California, it's hard not to, uh, you know, have a skateboard or a surfboard or even back then a BMX bike, yep. something along that line, too. Yeah, be outside all so. the time. Yeah, did you ever have a, a traditional outdoor slash adventure job? Did you work outdoor retail or anything like that? You know, I never, I, I never did have an actual job per se. Mm-hmm. Uh, growing up, I was more on the on the athlete side. So mm-hmm. you know, again, I was baseball player, and then I kind of transitioned into doing a lot of other sports, uh, and. Yeah, I never, I never really had an, an an outdoor, like let's say, a sales job at a right. sporting goods store. Yeah, never had anything like that. No. Yeah. And you were telling me all the adventures you went on as a kid. You always had a camera with you. Yeah, I- exactly. I was, I was a kid. If we went dirt bike riding or dune buggy riding out in the mud dunes or something, uh, sitting in sand dunes, uh, I'd be the guy with a camera. Mm-hmm. I would be that little kid with a camera. <laughs> so you had a camera yeah. from an early age. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, I was. I I don't know where it came from. I don't know how uh, it landed in my hand, but <laughs> right. I, was, I was I was just one of those kids that I think it was my first camera my grandfather gave me, or oh, cool. just kind of laying around and laying around, and I grabbed it and was shooting pictures of me and my buddies. And, now, yeah. did you? So you mentioned Chafee College, and then you went on to Brooks. Did you uh, take photo classes at Chafee? Did you take the black and white at Chafee College that we all took back in the day? Uh, interesting yeah i actually did <laughs> yep so did I. I actually did yeah that's funny yeah, yeah. and then you went to yeah. you went to brooks graduated from brooks and shot all over the world so tell us a little bit about your photo career yeah so uh geez going going back quite a ways here in the uh kind of mid to late 80s 
uh, as I mentioned, obviously, you know, as a kid growing up and through my teens, I would shoot a ton of photos of my buddies and, uh, whether they're surfing or skateboarding or motocross riding or what have you. And, um, and I ended up getting a, uh, kind of an editorial assistant job, uh, at a magazine. I was now at that time I was living in Carlsbad down okay. in uh, North County, San Diego. And mm-hmm. Ended up getting a job at a, a surf magazine down there and didn't even really know that you could get paid <laughs> shooting pictures. That was <laughs> never really in my, in my grasp, you know, wow. as a youngster. You were going to be a ball player. And I was, I, I thought I was going to be a ball player. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. 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 Uh-huh. thought I was going to be a ball player. And yeah. the, I think at the time he was the editor in chief or managing editor, whatever they call it. Uh, he saw that I had some sort of talent and, and, and suggested that I go to school and study and to do it right. Mm. Uh, opposed to just being a sports or a, a surf photographer mm-hmm. uh, standing on the beach every day. So oh, that's good advice. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> little, little did I know, little did I know back then. So, <laughs> right. um, and I heeded his advice and, mm. and, you know, at that time I think he gave me a bunch of assignments and, mm. you know, again, I think I was, I don't know, 16, 17, 18 years old at wow. the most. Very cool. And, uh, and I, you know, he would, he would, he was, he was an interesting guy. Most people thought that he would, you know, he was really hard on him and, uh, you know, kind of a tough SOB and, mm-hmm. and what have you. And I just soaked it up like a sponge. Mm-hmm. Anybody that was willing to give me, give me time a day and, and, uh, information like that, I would take. What kind of assignments did he give you? Um, okay. So going back into the eighties, yeah. uh, as one example, we didn't have auto features on cameras. <laughs> uh, we didn't even have, we didn't have digital cameras, let alone anything auto on them. Right. Right. And, and so, Shooting surfing, um, most people know that, you know, you see these big, long lenses, 800 millimeter, 600 Mm -hmm. millimeter lenses. Mm -hmm. Back then, you had to manually focus everything. Mm -hmm. And it was, and for me, it was really difficult to get a razor sharp image because if you're shooting a surfer moving on a wave, essentially a subject moving on a subject, so it's like this dual compound moving at you and laterally getting it really sharp and focused was pretty difficult. Uh And so if you can imagine shooting film and then you get you process your film, you get it back and you have this great looking picture (laughs) and then, and then you go, dang it, it's out of focus or it's soft. So I say that only to lead up to one of the assignments that he gave me. And he had said, your, your images are not sharp. They're not sharp enough to reproduce in the magazine. So mm-hmm. this is what I want you to do. And so he said, go to the freeway overpass and follow cars that are doing 60, you know, 65 miles an hour down the freeway okay. and shoot photos of that over and over and over and over and over. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was the most kind of obscure, obnoxious thing to do. But <laughs> Looking boring. back in hindsight, How boring, <laughs> incredibly boring, right? And that that helped out uh, my ability so much. I bet. Well, when so, you think about yeah, it, it makes yeah. sense because that's exactly what a surfer is doing: is moving across a wave. And mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. Oh, wow, very cool. So, were yeah, you exactly. were you shooting slides at that point? Slide film. Um, I pretty much shot and any and everything I could get my hands on. Okay. Yeah. Um. Obviously, back in the day, yeah, magazines wanted the transparency files because they were just much richer and uh, reproduced much better. Right. But if I could get my hands on black and white or even negative film, Mm -hmm. I would shoot it. Do you remember what your first camera was? What kind of camera it was? Uh, My first, first camera that was my own personal one was a Nikonis. Okay, Uh uh-huh. Yeah, it was a waterproof camera. Uh So you got in the water with Um, that then, shot surfers, I'll bet. Yeah, that was the one that I first bought, and uh, of course, just being a run-of-the-mill average kid, you know, I didn't have a lot of money, and the first camera I bought was was so I could swim out into the ocean with my buddies that were surfing and <laughs> and shoot pictures of them there. Yeah. Wow. So, what was your first more? How, when did you graduate to a more professional occupation? So that was just on assignment, and you got paid. And when did you shoot your first brand shot, if you will, or you know, something like that? Um, wow, that's, 
that's that's a good question. I mean, there's been so many of them. Yeah, over the years, uh, they kind of, just lot. kind of sandwich sandwich uh, one another. Um, it, it it wasn't like I started my career and then all of a sudden it was you know Bing 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 everything lined up and the you know uh, the world yeah. was my oyster. Yeah. It was just a little here and a little there. Like my very first paid photo shoot. Um, I, it, it, I was just shooting portraits of this surfer, Jim Hogan, at a buddy of mine's house uh, down in uh, Capistrano Beach, down by San Clemente. Mm-hmm. And I shot portraits of him and standing next to a surfboard. I mean, just simple, oh, yeah, harmless okay. portraits. Sure. And, then I, and then I got a phone call, I don't know, a day or two after that and, and from, from Jim. And he had said, hey, listen, uh, one of my sponsors wants to use one of the photos. Is that cool? I'm like, yeah, of course. <laughs> now I didn't realize anything, you know, I didn't even, I had never made a, I had never made a penny from any of my pictures right, at this point. Right. No, no you model know, release, I, no nothing. <laughs> nothing. Absolutely nothing. So yeah. I was like, yeah, sure. No problem. <laughs> and then I get a phone call from one of the guys at Astro Tech, uh, which is a surfing, you know, accessory brand. Mm-hmm. And they said, Hey, Herbie, her, her, meaning Herbie Fletcher. Herbie yeah. wants to use this photo, and and you know we pay seventy five bucks. Can you send us an invoice? <laughs> and I was kind of dumbfounded on the other end of the phone because I think they had called the magazine or something uh, that I was working at, and and I was like, oh, uh, okay, <laughs> yeah, sure. Wow, <laughs> I that's didn't, awesome. Um, yeah, yeah. So, you know, do you remember your first was, uh, location that you went traveled to to shoot? Um, that uh, professionally or just yeah, professionally? Well, either way, either professionally. Way. Yeah, I think professionally would be ho- probably Hawaii because I was okay. really into surfing, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, I mean, I would go up and down the coast here. I would go to some of the islands off the coast of California, uh, but mainly stay on the continental coast. You know, mm-hmm. like I'd go up to Rincon in Santa Barbara. I'd know that, or I would go up to. Steamers Lane in Santa Cruz, or even, I mean, in San Diego, where I was living, was, sure. we had some really world-class waves, so mm-hmm. didn't really have to travel too far to get some great shots. Uh, but my first big trip was definitely to Hawaii and to the North Shore of Oahu. And, you know, I mean, coming from Southern California, we have big waves here, but, yeah. you know, going there, and you see the waves there. The I've never been to Hawaii. Wrong. No, that's, I've never been oh, to Oh, you Hawaii. haven't? No, for one of the... One places i need to get to yeah it's it's one of those interesting places that your very first trip there uh it's kind of it's shocking almost because mm-hmm. you hear about all these great stories uh, of the you know the famous the world famous bonsai pipeline mm-hmm. or ymma mm-hmm. Bay or you know all these other places and that's all great and you see it in the magazine but when you put your feet on the sand there mm-hmm. you're looking at 10 or 15 foot barrel that's like you know, 50 or 80 yards off the beach. And there's a guy standing in the middle of this huge barreling wave that's thundering and just breaking on the reef. And the sand is like, almost like thunder under your feet. Yeah, It's a wake up call. That's got to move you. Yeah. That's got to move you. It does. It's, it's, uh, yeah, at the same time, it's exhilarating and you're just like coming out of your skin. And as a surfer, you want to get out there as a photographer. And I specialize in the water. I wanted to get out there, and uh, yeah, both were and pretty dangerous out there. I didn't realize how dangerous that that break is. It is incredibly dangerous. Yeah. There's, uh, I'm by no means an expert uh, at that level of you know shooting, serving, and mm-hmm. um, I mean, I, I've had my fair share of shooting amazing pictures in the water, but there are guys that are literally. Uh, uh, just specialists and, you know, yeah. shooting heavy, heavy, heavy waves like that from the water. And, yeah. and I only say that to, to highlight, you know, you really need to know the currents mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. Uh, rip tides and where, you know, where to, where to be. And at first glance, you, you don't see all of that from the beach, mm-hmm. um, you know, but, uh, and like anything, you, you learn it quickly. Yeah. And like <laughs> anything that you get into doing, you got to know your escape route. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And there, you know, it's um, it's 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 heavy. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Meaning, meaning, it's a very heavy location to shoot in. There's a lot of 
you know, little rips. There's uh, uh, just little marker points. I don't want to, you know, say too much here about it. But I mm-hmm. like I said, I'm not, you know, a Hawaiian expert at, yeah, at yeah, shooting yeah. a pipe, but yeah. um, but I do know enough about it that there's, you know, it's to be hugely respected. And yeah. the guys that are out there, that are the experts, or you know, are the the everyday pros, man, those guys are. They're amazing. Yeah, they're amazing. And when they're did you amazing. when did you uh, get into shooting uh, snow snow sports? About the same time. Yeah, no, um, no, not the same time. I was shooting surfing for quite a while, and mm-hmm. then I think I was probably just about uh, twenty, maybe twenty one or so, and I got out of school and came back to San Diego, and then. Um, my former editor had said, Hey, you want to go to Banff, Canada with me, uh, to, to shoot an assignment. I need an assistant. So long story made short, uh, I went up with him and I shot, uh, oh, cool. snowboarding for the first time in my life. And we happened to get it really good with, you know, at that time, it was like knee deep or, you know, just, just over knee deep of powder. And it nice. was amazing. Mm-hmm. And, and I forget the guy's name. I don't even actually think I knew him, but though I was stumbling at first and I had a big camera bag on the, on my back <laughs> and I kept falling over and over and over. And the guy said, Hey, it's just like surfing. And I was like, what? Oh, interesting. <laughs> okay. And he's like, he's like, yeah, just like drop in on a wave, man, and go uh-huh. and pick up your speed. Uh-huh. And I don't even know who the guy was. And I said, Oh, and something clicked in my head and I just stood up and, pointed the board down the hill and got it moving and then it just kind of elevated in the wow. powder yeah cool and and you know like if you have ever surfed you know that you kind of get into that glide mm-hmm. and no feeling like it and all of a sudden i was just linking these turns <laughs> and it, 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 it just clicked. happened that yeah. fast wow. it clicked yeah. and i was like oh my gosh this is amazing <laughs> and you were yeah. hooked that's amazing. I was hooked. That yeah. was the, that was it. So and then uh, I think, that, yeah. But, but, no, go ahead. Keep going. I was going to say, and then so to answer answer your question, then I get back, and then the magazine, the oh, hang on, I have a little bleep here. Um, so I get back, and uh, the guys at the magazine were starting a new magazine, and said, "Hey, do you want to go on this uh, national tour?" Uh, the professional snowboarding tour. And so uh, I started following the snowboarding tour around the country. Very cool. And then that led, led itself into following them around the world. Right. And, yeah, yeah. So you shot all over the world. Is there a favorite place you want to go back to? Or somewhere you haven't been that you want to go to? Oh, my gosh. Uh, yes to both. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I've, I've been to South America, and I've been very fortunate to be... Uh, to you know, to have gone to South America and Chile in, mm. in specific, uh, many times. And, uh, that, th- that place is just absolutely unbelievable from the Andes mountain ranges to even further South toward Patagonia, the, in the volcanic region down there, there's mm. a series of volcanoes that, uh, they're just amazing. And in the right conditions, uh, boy, you can get this big, big, big mountain experience um, with, I don't want to say no exposure to danger, but a lot less exposure mm-hmm. to danger. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, where the big open powder fields and cliff drops, and they're so big mm-hmm. that uh, they're steep. There's a lot of great steepness uh, there, but uh, I, I would say it's just bigger mountain riding um, then let's say if you're at Mammoth or, right, and, and right. you know, but nothing it, against Mammoth. Sure, no, it's a, it's a different scale. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a different scale. Yeah, and sense. then I would say on the other side of uh, that question, the place that I would love to go back to, that uh, we only got it good once is a place in, in Morocco called Kaimadin. Hmm. And we had tracked storms going in and out of there, and uh, we finally locked into one that was coming over the Sahara Desert basically stopped on top of the high Atlas mountain range. Oh, wow. And we literally got on, we meeting a handful of three, four bodies of mine, a writer and three athletes and myself jumped on flights from, from around the world where we ever were, where we all were. And, uh, 
and descended upon Marrakesh and ended up uh, going up into the, into the mountains there and scored the, the most driest powder nice. that I think that we've ever experienced. Yeah, yeah, very cool. Those are one-of-a-kind days, I'm sure. One-of-a-kind days. Yeah. True story. On the way driving up to the ski resort, this old, old pre-military, pre-World War II uh, <laughs> ski resort, yeah. the roads were covered with about two and a half or three feet of snow. And it was so light and dry and airy of snow that when we were driving back down that same road in the afternoon or early evening, those roads roads were nearly dry. Really? Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was that light and fluffy and airy of, yeah. uh, Holy of snowpack. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. So what was one of your most challenging shoots? Oh, boy. I'm sure you've been um, some epic storms or something. Yeah, there's been a handful. I mean, one that comes to mind, it's, it's certainly in snowboarding. Uh, I would say one that was in the backcountry of Solden and Meyerhofen in Austria, in the Austrian Alps. And we got uh, kind of sidetracked, you know, because me as a, as a photographer, you know, I've got all the gear and we have radios. Mm-hmm. And usually I'm on one side of, let's say, of a ridge line shooting across the ridge line, mm-hmm. or if I'm on the same line as the athlete, I go down the run first, mm-hmm. typically, and then I'll either stop under the cliff or take a different line down and then hike back up so I could position myself under the cliff as they're dropping over or what have you. Well, I don't know what happened, but it was a fast-moving storm came in, and we got separated and it was just, I'll just say, it was a very, very long day for me to find my way back to base camp. And, wow. Um, yeah, I ended up going down the mountain and basically not making a left, <laughs> for, for lack of better words, and I just kept going straight down. Hey. And it, it could have ended really badly where me, just a guy that didn't really know the mountains, yeah. um, I, I could have just been out in the middle of the mountains in a snowstorm and been buried. Right. Um, but fortunately... Uh, I kept going and kept going and kept going. And, uh, I finally came to a road. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I thought I was going to come back down to the bottom of the ski resort. Cause we were just off to the, off a ridge line or two off of the ski resort. I thought I was fading down left and fading left and fading left, but I apparently wasn't. <laughs> and <laughs> it turned out that I was, I don't know, about four miles away from the ski resort by the time I hit this road and, Ended up packing it back down and hitchhiking, and oh, geez. but yeah. that was, was lucky. Yeah. yeah, that was that was one of the the more heavier ones, and, yeah. and I'm downplaying it because it was really, I mean, it was a whiteout storm, and you oh, could barely sure. see, yeah. yeah, like you couldn't see the trees in front of you, or mm-hmm. you right. couldn't see anything fifty feet in front of you. It was really bad, scary. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so in addition to to managing the shoot, you navigated all the various travel and venture travel and. Was that the inspiration for uh, launching Adriatic Academy? You just recently launched an adventure travel company. Did that come from all your experience managing all these athletes and getting them all around the world? Or how did you get that? Yeah, it, well, it's, um, yeah, I mean, me being able to, to manage and, and, and run the Adriatic Academy comes from, you know, a few decades or almost a few decades of leading trips of pro athletes and, mm-hmm. Uh, magazine trips around the world and essentially producing all of those. Oh, right. Uh, you know, yeah, you know, those don't, those trips don't pop into, <laughs> into fruition. You know, somebody has to literally plan everything. Sure. And, uh, and a lot of pro athletes and some people may or may not understand it, but you know, those guys and girls are, they're really busy. They have commitments. And so if we're putting a trip together, it's, it's a collective of people behind the scenes mm-hmm. uh, that are really making everything happen so that athlete can show up at that airport and, you know, that airport could be any airport in the world. Right. Um, you know, and, and typically and often is. Mm-hmm. And so usually me, the photographer, and I have my guys, we will produce everything. Um, and, and like I said, literally make it so where so that a team manager can have their athlete uh, on an airplane and being dropped off at some airport and we're there to pick them up. Yeah, and, yeah, and, and coordinating all the gear and all the hotels and everything. Oh, yeah, yeah everything, yeah, all yeah, of that. I yeah. mean, from transportation and meals to accommodations, uh, 
and, and everything in between mm-hmm. from the time that we get from the airport and back to the airport. It's so usually on us. So, so you're basically running an adventure travel company, um, and now you've launched yeah. Adriatic Academy. Tell everybody what Adriatic Academy is about. Yeah, so the Adriatic Academy is the new uh, it's a new business that uh, we formed a couple of years ago. Um, so it's a lot different than what we've been talking about in the sense that uh, it's based in the Adriatic Sea. That's nothing to do with snow or snowboarding. <laughs> I was online, um, man. It's beautiful. Jeez. <laughs> it's gorgeous. Yeah, there it is. yeah, it is. But I, but I caveat that by saying, you know, there are some, uh, the Alps are really close to Croatia. And so uh, don't, uh, don't count us out yet. We may have some sort of uh, adventure activity <laughs> in the winter. Cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But yeah, but for now we're going to stick to uh, the summertime, and, and so yeah, so that has come about in the last ten or fifteen years of my life, um, and of course my childhood growing up on the ocean mm. uh, and traveling the world. You know, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see that we've done a lot of damage to this planet. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's part and partial. It's my wife and I's way to say, "Hey, we're going to do something about this." Oh, cool. And, and so with uh, my wife is, her family is from Croatia. She spent most of her life traveling back and forth, uh, there. She was raised here in the States, but, uh, every year she would be over there visiting family and whatnot. So, mm-hmm. um, so we decided a few years ago to, um, to do something and we wanted to spend more time over there. We want to spend more time traveling that part of the world. Cause I had never been there and I had never traveled extensively there. So, um, my first trip there was about 10 or 12 years ago. And ever since then, I just fell in love with the place. And it's beautiful. It, it's, it's everlasting. As I like to say, mm. because it's like every hill you turn, uh, excuse me, every corner you turn or every hill you go over, there's something more amazing there. Mm. Uh, and I, and even to this day, I'm learning more and more and more about some amazing things and places there. Um, I most recently learned about a bear sanctuary, uh, wow. that's up in the mountains. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. It's, it's amazing. Oh. It's very cool. So, yeah. so we, yeah, so we started the Adriatic Academy. We call the Adriatic Adventure Academy. Um, and we do a series of retreats, uh, usually groups of eight or less. And we lead uh, these groups on just amazing retreats for eight or 10 days at a time. And we just share the, the various areas of the country from the islands to, uh, old, you know, pre dating pre Christ, like, you know, 30, 40 years before mm-hmm. Christ, mm-hmm. Wow. uh, you know, the old Roman amphitheater where gladiators once battled right. and, uh, you know, that's still standing to this day. Yeah. It's amazing. Um, yeah or some of these old walled villages that, you know, were the inspiration for the, that HBO series, Game of Thrones. Oh, yeah. Uh, these are literal places that you stand and look at. And, you know, if you're from America and you're from here, uh, you kind of look at it and you're like, man, that looks like a Hollywood movie set. <laughs> it, you know, that's yeah, the first yeah. thing that comes to mind because, yeah. you know, he, here in the States, we don't, we don't have that here. So, yeah, we're pretty young compared to the rest of the world. It's pretty amazing. Comparatively speaking, yes, yeah. we are. Yeah. Yes, we are. So. so with all your experience, you know, managing athletes all around the world, have there been any surprises in launching this new venture? Um, yeah, well, I think with anything, mm-hmm. you know, there's there's always surprises. <laughs> um, fortunately, knock on wood here, there hasn't been anything that's been too catastrophic or uh, too big for us to overcome, but, mm-hmm. um, you know, there's, there's all kinds of things that pop up all the time. That's um, why it's called adventure travel. <laughs> it's not, a, it's not, <laughs> it's not adventure till something goes wrong. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's a great way to put it. It's not adventure till something goes wrong. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, it just, just coordinating everything and, you know, Croatia is an old country. Um, it's amazing place, the people, the culture, the food. I mean, it's a really, really, really cool place. And they, too, are experiencing this huge boom in visitors and mm-hmm. tourism and whatnot. And mm-hmm. so I, I don't want to say that they're young in the tourism game because they are definitely not. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, um, it's interesting when you go to certain places, 
um, they're 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 feeling the the growth, you know. Um, oh, yeah. What do you call it? Kind of the the, the growing pains. Mm-hmm. Well, right? the onslaught of visitors. I think a lot of these places just have been inundated with you know people from all, all over. Not only America. I mean, the Russians travel and the you know Cubans travel. Oh, everybody uh, travels, and it's just it's hundred percent. Yeah, so many people. Yeah. And over there, yeah, over there, they're really close to Italy. They're really close to Austria and Germany, and you know they're they're kind of Central Europe, as you know. So. Yeah, mm-hmm, yeah. Um, you get travelers from all over, and now um, starting to see a lot more like Koreans. Definitely, there's a mm-hmm. ton of Australians, mm-hmm. um, obviously British and French and Italians and Slovenians and Germans. Um, right. Yeah, it's not uh, America is really just now starting to uh, kind of you know wake up and smell the roses of this mm-hmm. this place. Interesting, and so. And that's what we've been finding. And, and a lot of people that uh, even close friends of mine that have never been there, they'll see photographs of mine and, and they're just completely awestruck by it. And they're like, are you kidding? Is this Photoshop? And I'm like, no, nope. <laughs> it is beautiful. Well, yeah. It, I looked on your website. It's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah. yeah. And those cool. are not Photoshop. They're just, <laughs> uh, just regular photos. And when we set out to do our website, uh, that was one of the things that I wanted to make sure that, um, I didn't, you know, highly doctor any of the photos or mm-hmm. I didn't want to mislead anybody on anything. So on the Adriatic Academy's website, you'll see that the photos are just real. They're, That's they're amazing. Real. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody should go check it mm-hmm. out. Yeah. Adriaticacademy.com. Yeah. yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. And so have you had any mentors help you along the way, either with your photo career or launching this new venture? Anybody, you know, you looked yeah. up to? Yeah. Or? Oh, yeah. Huh. I mean, all the time. I wouldn't say, you know, I have mentors all the time, but mm-hmm. um, there's a lot of people that I look up to. There's a lot of people that have helped us, uh, mm-hmm. even to this day, you know, uh, from different different areas of life. You know, in yeah. my photo career, uh, you know, Guy Motil uh, was a huge inspiration for me, and uh, he was my first editor that I mentioned a, a bit ago. Um, and still a great friend of mine to this day, and will still give me some pretty sound and solid advice, uh, and even encouragement as a guy that's been doing it for 25 years myself or more. You know, I still need encouragement. Mm-hmm. And then there's guys on the other side of the fence from a business standpoint. Let's say, a um, good friend of mine, Tim Clay. He owns a tech company and does really well and uh, and whatnot, and and. I'll go to him and I'll just say, Hey, I'm struggling with this or mm-hmm. what would what would you do in this or that scenario? Oh, that's great. Mm-hmm. And so he's been yeah, so he's been really instrumental and and then I just had a lot of great friends that, you know, as a uh the as a young man or, you know, middle aged man myself, <laughs> you know, you you kind of have a um you know, a collective of people around you that you yeah. you've known for a bit and and a lot of those guys are really supportive and will just randomly call me up and say, Hey, That's you great. know this, or have you seen that? Or mm-hmm. so That's yeah, it's good yeah, to have, yeah. it's good to have resources like that. I have the same, same exactly. people in our industry and even way back to Fontana, a bunch of my Fontana buddies and I are still, still really tight. Um, That's right. <laughs> my best friend is from Fontana that I grew up with and he and I have been friends since we were seventh grade, eighth grade. Yeah. Same. And yeah. Just his birthday was yesterday, as a matter of fact. Oh, so I cool. talked with him yesterday. <laughs> right on. That's awesome. Good. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. And do you guys work with any nonprofit groups? Um, or support any? I'm sure uh, you you give to them. We yeah, all do, I mean, but... I do. I do. My wife independently does. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we do kind of a collective of different things. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like often I will donate my work to silent auctions, mm, right. um, mm-hmm. to raise money, uh, things like that. Everything from, let's say, working with back in the day with the Surfrider Foundation mm-hmm. to even more current, the Five Gyres Institute, uh, you know, places like that. Um, and then even as harmless as, let's say, the, the Red Cross, uh, mm-hmm. if something needs to happen, you know, like in Malibu and Calabasas area. You know, right, as everybody right. knows, there was some really horrific fires and whatnot. And yeah. um, so we're, we're doing what we can there to to help out on the ground and people that need food or water or 
animals that need help or what have That's you. Great. Right. So, yeah, cool. yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, uh, and then part of uh, the Adriatic Academy, our kind of our core mission is really based in conservation and education. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes, we go out and take people to amazing places and show them uh, these great locations and, you know, share some amazing food and culture and, and history with them. But really at the core to what we're doing is we're also exposing people to conservation okay. um, with a very soft hand to say, See how amazing this place is? Mm -hmm. It's amazing because it's taken care of. Mm -hmm. It's amazing because it's not trampled on. It's amazing because it's not developed. Mm -hmm. So, you know, obviously speaking English and being from America, you know, in my own way and and certainly my wife's, that's how we have this, our communication, so to speak, with people is, is kind of leading by example and leading people there to show them this stuff. Like right, I said, right. yes, it's amazing, but uh, um, but there's also a you know a, kind of an undertone to it uh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. to say you know if we don't take care of this, we can look at places around the world that have not been taken care of and they're either gone or they're a disaster. Right, right. Yeah. So you know the Adriatic Sea and Croatia and that area right now, yes, it's absolutely pristine and it's amazing. Um, and I implore everybody to go there, whether you come with us or not. Yeah, yeah. It's astonishing there. But, you know, um, what I do say is just remember, you know, if uh, you go somewhere, take your trash with you. Yeah, or tread lightly also. Yeah, yeah. Tread lightly. Yeah. Bingo. There you go. That's good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So do you still snowboard or play ball or what outdoor activities do you still participate in? Yeah, I don't play ball so much anymore. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's a bit of a of an organization, you know, a young uh, organization game. there. <laughs> yeah. Hey, listen, I mean, listen, I have friends that get out there and crack it, you know, softball and they're in men's leagues and stuff like that. Right, so right. I can't really, I can't really complain too much about that, but, <laughs> um, uh, no, I'm kind of more on the individualistic side of things where, you know, yes, I'll still snowboard. Um, if we have good snow, I'm a bit of a, a powder hound and, you know, older bones and, uh, you know, stuff like that. So I don't like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'm not really a, a groomed run, you know, <laughs> ski, ski resort snowboarder. Gotcha. Okay. Um, yeah. And then I'll paddleboard and sail and mountain bike and cycle and stuff like that. Uh, often. Nice. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. So go try and get out there and, and, uh, you're not hooking it in the parks, it. huh? Sorry. You're not hucking it in the parks, huh? The snowboard. The park. <laughs> no, 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 no. Those days, those days are definitely behind me. Yeah, yeah. I don't even ski yeah. anymore. My knees are so bad. And I tell everybody, if both my feet leave the ground at the same time, something went very wrong. <laughs> <laughs> something went wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll still, I'll still drop a, you know, drop a little air between me and the ground, but mm-hmm. definitely not too much. Yeah, and good, uh, yeah. I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm enjoying it. I, good. You there know, you go. Yeah. But, yeah, for the longest time I would do it, and I was on some great runs and some great powder areas, and uh, I had a big backpack of film gear right, on my back. Right. And, you know, unlike the guys I was filming, you know, they get to, you know, do these beautiful runs and deep pow and and love it. And I, you know, I didn't really get to do that much. Mm-hmm, yeah. Uh, so when I do, yeah, when I go ride now, it's usually just free riding and usually by myself with my headphones on and just go be by myself and go ride pal or go ride the trees and yeah cool that's yeah. good yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so yeah. after all your years of of success and your your renowned career do you have any suggestions or advice for folks either wanting to get into the outdoor adventure photo biz or grow their career if they're already in the biz um yeah i would say like anybody that's going to have a long career like if they're doing it for a career right mm-hmm. um I, I would say first and foremost, just, you know, if you know what you want to do, like if, if you are a photographer and that is hugely your passion, then mm-hmm. go for it. Um, but I had some very, very sound advice when I was young, go educate yourself and mm-hmm. not just mm-hmm. to be a photographer, but educate yourself in the business. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because if you're going to follow, the, let's say as a photographer, if you're going to follow the footsteps of being a photographer, you can't forget that you're a business and you really are no different than a plumber or a contractor yep. or any other small business. So 
you know, um, in lectures that I've given at universities or workshops that I've taught, at the end of the day, this is the same message that I still tell everybody is you're a business and you have to run your business accordingly. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's probably 20% taking pictures and, uh, 80% running a business. Mm, that's good advice. Yeah. And all, yeah. And all that encompasses that. Mm-hmm. Now, yeah. if you don't know what you're doing for those, uh, people out there that let's say they don't really know what they want to do yet, but they're definitely outdoor enthusiasts, you know, um, Go, go see if you can get a job at one of the local outdoor adventure outfitters, like an REI or uh, one of those places. Um, go to the ski resorts in the winter and get a job as a lift operator. Um, you know, something along that line. Go, if you live near the beach or something, go get a job at a surf shop, mm-hmm. right? A lifeguard and, be a lifeguard, just, yeah. <laughs> yeah, lifeguards, um, certainly here in California, they're really difficult to get a job at. But, That's what I've heard. Um, or, or, excuse me, job with, but, um, but yeah, I mean, you know, if you're, if you're definitely a water dog, then, you know, become a lifeguard or certainly something like that. Right. Yeah. No, that's good. Advice, um, yeah. 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 Cool. Um, do you have any daily routines you use to keep your sanity? Walk the dog, <laughs> exercise. Um, well, yeah, exercise is definitely high on the, you know, high on the benchmark there. Mm-hmm. Um, Usually my mornings start fairly early um, just because I try to keep myself on a, a middle ground of my of my body clock being in Europe or versus in America. And mm. being all the way out here on California, <laughs> we don't realize it, but it is kind of far away from the, you know, the Greenwich Mean Time. So, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, like in Croatia and that area, England, they're nine hours ahead of us. So... I'm constantly communicating with people over there, which means, uh, you know, I'm now living my life nine hours in front of me. And so, uh, so I try to get up early as early as I possibly can. And, you know, I have my morning coffee and read and, and whatnot. And then usually, uh, it's either mountain biking or if I am at home, you know, yeah. uh, uh, it's usually just kind of getting caught up with life. Yeah. Right. right? Um, but if I'm not at home, which is more often than not, uh, you know, I just try and try and uh, acclimate to the region or area that I am in and, and, uh, live, yeah. you know, I mean, you, <laughs> get you know, through the days. Get yeah, yeah, yeah. Get in, get into it. And I don't yeah. know, I've never been the one that's uh, dictated by the sunlight. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, snowboarding, you get up before the sun and, and you're hiking mountains and preparing for that first light and the same with surfing. Yeah. Right. right? right so, yeah. um, yeah, 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 yeah. But there are those. There's those rare occasions that um, you know I'm sleeping in, and and the sun has already come up, and those <laughs> days are nice too. <laughs> nice, right? Yeah. Um, do you have any yeah. favorite books, or have you do you give books as gifts very often? Um, I don't give books, uh, and my wife's going to kill me for saying this, but it is the truth. I don't give <laughs> books as gifts as much as I probably should. Uh-huh. Um, my wife is the book giver. Okay, and. You know, she, I, I don't know why, but there's this uh, TV show uh, called Fixer Upper on the uh, Home and Garden TV, HGTV network. Okay. And there's the, the TV show Fixer Upper. There's this guy, Chip Gaines, and he wrote a recent, recently wrote a book, and it's called Capital Gaines, and it's all about uh, he and his wife's little business and how it's grown into a small empire. So my wife just gave me that book, hmm. uh, so I'm just starting to read that. Uh, seems a little intriguing, but I... You know, honestly, I just cracked it open a day or so ago. Good. So I can't uh-huh. profess that. But one of my favorite books by far is a, um, in the world kind of uh, both of business and sanity, is a book called Blue Ocean Strategies. Mm, I, agree. That's right. I read that. It's a great book. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a really, really, really good book. And, you know, it just kind of, I think in many ways it, it asks us to, think outside the box mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, look at life and, and be a part of life in a different way. Yeah. So, it's a good book on a lot of fronts too. It talks about business, but also you're right. The, the, the fact that we're all interconnected, that's, that's a pretty deep book. That's a good one. Yeah. 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 yeah it really is. Yeah. It really is. Do you have a favorite so, piece of outdoor gear under a hundred dollars? Oh, a favorite piece of gear under a hundred bucks. <laughs> 
Uh, that's a good one, actually. <laughs> uh, let's see. Let's see. There's probably a couple of those, a <laughs> couple of bits there that I should. Um, I would definitely say, you know, kind of like a dimmable headlamp. Mm, okay. uh, and, and I'm really just kind of going into my, my mind here of what I use in, in critical situations. So, um, Headlamp comes up a lot. A lot of folks have said headlamp. That's almost a priceless item, I think. You have to have it with you all it, the time, especially if you're up you know what? early and it is. Yeah, out late. Yeah. It, it is. And a, and, a, and a quick story, and it really came into handy. And, uh, and, and I caveat it by saying get one of the, the headlamps that is dimmable and mm-hmm. that it has both, you know, either a red or a green or both side lights on it. So mm-hmm. not just the. Right. Uh, not just the white light that's like medium, low, and high, uh, or low, medium, high, but also get one that's uh, that's got a red diffused light on it, and here's why. Um, recently, I was on a 16-day trip aboard a, uh, a this this yacht going from San Diego through the Panama Canal, mm. and we did 16, 17 days of open ocean sailing, and when I say the sun goes down and it turns black, I mean it turns <laughs> black. <laughs> there, I mean, there's absolutely no light. Literally, the only light you are seeing are the stars above you. And wow. to turn on even the lowest setting on the headlamp is way too bright. Oh, blinds you. Oh, yeah. It completely blinds you. Hmm. And when you need to read your navigational maps, or if you're just sitting on the deck reading a book, mm-hmm. right? The the diffused red light or the lamp um, is absolutely key. Wow. Mm. Um, I, I got one that had both red and green, and mm-hmm. so I found that using the green one was much, uh, much better. I didn't get tired as fast, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so that's definitely something that for an adventure type of person, Bottom line is you could just never go wrong with, with a headlamp like that. Mm-hmm. And if you're in a situation where you need to use both of your hands and still see and do things, right? you know, those those are critical to have. Yeah, no, that's good. Um, that's good. Yeah, I never thought about the red and green. I've thought about the red from, you know, if you're out there with doing photography and you got lights and things going on, you obviously have the red lamp going. But I never thought about it for reading, and I've never been in the middle of the ocean like that. So that's a, that's great advice. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's they're they're really critical, and it's uh, and I was it's, honestly as much as I would love to take credit for that, um, <laughs> it's I really can't. Um, I'm just imparting some wisdom that was shared with me, and that was from uh, Captain Troy Sears, who's the the captain of the the schooner yacht America, and he he was the one that told me that. And he's like, mm-hmm. bring a, you know, make sure you bring a headlamp and. Blah blah blah. Because mm-hmm. I would have gone without one. Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. That's so, great advice. And I yeah. think, yeah, the only other thing that I can say for for somebody that's a, a diehard adventurer, it, or somebody that's getting into adventuring, mm-hmm. make sure that you bring a a really good external battery, um, one that can not just plug in, you know, and charge. Uh, let's charge whatever you want to charge, Mm -hmm. you know, via USD or what have you. But Mm -hmm. a lot of them, uh, like the the types that I have, they'll also have a very powerful flashlight feature to them, Mm -hmm. um, blinking red and blue lights, Mm -hmm. excuse me, red and yellow lights, uh, little features like that. Mm -hmm. Good, good. Um, Yeah, cool. Yeah. We'll we'll, uh, we'll put mm -hmm. links to those in the show notes so everybody can see what we're talking about. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Yeah. So those are, yeah. Those are good ones. Yeah, those are, uh, you know, uh, indispensable in a lot of cases. They they really are, yeah. and they they come into they come in handy in in, in a lot of different scenarios. Yeah, Even right. if you're just find yourself going from airplane to airplane, and your battery and your cell phone is dying, yeah, right, like, right. Hey, you know, yeah. uh, what do I do? Yeah. Yeah. So you know, as we wrap up, so. is there anything else you'd like to ask of our listeners or say to our listeners? Um, well, I would, of course, love everybody to, you know, come by and check us out on our website, adrioticacademy.com. Cool. We'll link to that in the uh, show notes. Yeah, good. Oh, very cool. Very cool. 
and yeah, learn a little bit about us. You'll see that, uh, you know, that, um, that who we are and what we're about is, is really caring for and caring about the planet and other people and sharing and educating people. Cool. Um, and, and most people find that, uh, find that when they come and visit us or come on our retreats. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And can they reach out to you by email or just best places to contact you through the website? How can they reach out if they have um, questions for you or? Yeah. That both. They can definitely reach me on email. Okay. Sean, S-H-A-W-N, at patrioticacademy.com. And of course, uh, they can fill out the uh, information page on the contact us uh, section in our website. Cool. So, yeah, yeah, that awesome. too. Well, we'll link to all that in the show notes. Well, Sean, it's been great catching up. We uh, have to meet for a beer one of these days. We're, you know, we're relatively <laughs> close. I'm up a bishop. You come up chasing that pal in Mammoth, give a holler. Oh, I guarantee it. And, and thanks for uh, spending the time and, and, uh, and chatting with me too, man. It's been yeah. good to catch up with you. Yeah, it's been fun. All right. Have a, have a good day. Very cool. All right. Thanks, Rick. All right. Talk see you. Soon. Yep. Bye. All right. I hope you enjoyed that wide ranging conversation with Sean Frederick. You can follow up with Sean via the contact us link on the Adriatic Venture Academy website, any of their socials, and by email at sean at adrianticacademy.com. Sean is spelled S-H-A-W-N. Adriatic is A-D-R-I-A-T-I-C. You'll find links to everything we discussed in the show notes at theoutdoorbizpodcast.com slash episode 141. Be sure to share this with five of your friends and hit your favorite podcast app to subscribe today. Thanks for listening. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. I've used Audible for many years now. I'm on the road a lot, and Audible allows me to enjoy the great books I discover or are recommended by friends. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com slash the Outdoor Biz Podcast. There are over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Start your 30-day free trial with Audible today. If you want more of the Outdoor Biz Podcast, you can subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Be sure to go to theoutdoorbizpodcast.com where you'll find all the links to the episode, show notes, and much, much more. And be sure to make time to get outside and take someone with you.